Today I'm going to talk about batteries. When we pick up one of these, we often call it a battery, but the correct name would be a cell or a voltaic cell. It is a single entity that produces a voltage, and when we put multiple cells together, we get a battery. So this should be a cell, and several of them should be called a battery. But we call this a battery, and we put a bunch together, we call them batteries. Well, that's the way the language works. I'm not going to say, you must call this a cell, and you must call a bunch of them a battery. It's a battery, we put them together, they are batteries. So that's what this is. Now, well, how are these constructed? Basically, a battery is two dissimilar metals in an acid or a base. So if we take two different metals, let's say we have some copper and some zinc. In fact, the first battery made by Alessandro Volta was made pretty much of that. So here's some zinc, so a disc of copper, a disc of zinc, and Volta took some paper that was saturated in, I believe, sulfuric acid and put them together. And then we put another layer of copper and another layer of acid soaked paper and some zinc. And uh, I think this produced something like about a half of a volt if I remember correctly, and then that produces another half of a volt. So together we have one volt. So we stack batteries together and we stack the voltages together. Sort of like stacking bricks on top of each other. The more bricks you have, the higher you get. The more uh, batteries or cells we put together, the more voltage we get. And you can keep adding these together until you get some fairly high voltages. And then after Volta invented this, the other types of batteries were invented. A common way of doing it was to have little cups of sulfuric acid and then putting uh, uh, strips of copper and zinc in opposite ends to make the battery. But uh, nevertheless, what we have, two dissimilar metals with an acid. And the acid acting on the different metals releases a different number of, or an imbalance of electrons. So one is going to release more electrons than the other. So we have an imbalance of electrons, which gives us a voltage, and therefore we can connect a wire between the two and we can get an electric current. And once this was discovered, then Orsted was able to uh, run a, an electric current through a wire and discover that there was a magnetic field around that wire. And basically the battery is what made our modern world what it is now. Have we not uh, invented the battery, we would not have ever had sustainable electric currents, and we wouldn't have discovered all of the things we know about electronics today. So that's what made the modern world what it is. So that is what a battery is. Two dissimilar metals with an acid, and we get a dissimilar um, uh, action on there to release electrons. And if you've ever seen a lemon battery or a potato battery, what do we do? We stick a couple of nails in, uh, one uh, that's uh, zinc plated, the other one's not zinc plated, so we have different uh, metals, or we can shove a penny in one and a nail in the other that are different metals, and we can get a voltage, but I have some pictures here of people doing exactly that. So that's what a battery is. And we are able to produce uh, sustained currents and operate our electronics. And even modern electronics that plug into the wall, we have what are called power supplies, which basically simulate a battery. So different chemistries will produce different amount of voltages per cell. So just as an example, uh, a carbon zinc battery will produce, I think, 1.6 volts per cell. Uh, your alkaline battery will produce uh, 1.58 volts per cell, I think is typical, although different companies have different chemistries, so you might see a slightly different voltage. Uh, lithium batteries uh, produce 3.7 volts per cell. A lead acid battery, such as a car battery, uh, that's not too dissimilar metals, is it? Well, actually, the way a lead acid battery is made, you put two plates of lead and put a current across there, and it causes, uh, if I remember the chemistry correctly, one plate becomes lead oxide and the other plate becomes lead sulfide, and now you do have two dissimilar metals and you can discharge those, and then you can reverse the process and do it over again. And that's going to produce, I think, 2.2 volts per cell. So your typical power car battery is six cells producing 2.2 volts each. 
So 2.2 volts per cell, and we have six of them. We could say, what is it, 13.2 volts total for your car battery uh, uh, under normal conditions. So we call it a 12 volt battery, but it's more like 13.2. So a different uh, uh, chemistry produces different amounts of voltage per cell, and we put those together to get more and more volts. Uh, another thing to know about a battery, other than the type of voltage it produces, is the uh, amp hour rating. So amp hours tells us, well, let's say we have a battery that is one amp hour. What that tells us is that it can produce one amp for one hour. Or perhaps it can produce 0.5 amps for two hours. Or let's say we have a battery that's rated at 10 amp hours. Okay, that means it can produce 10 amps for an hour or 5 amps for two hours or maybe 20 amps for one half hour, 0.5 hours. So the amp hour rating is how we rate the capacity of a battery. And that capacity is going to depend, to depend on its chemistry and its size. So a physically bigger battery is going to have more bulk of chemistry in there and can last longer and will have a longer amp hour rating. So I can have, um, oh, for example, just off the top of my head, a double A, nickel cadmium battery has a amp hour rating typically of 500 milliamp hours. So that would be 0.5 amp hours for your typical AA nickel cadmium battery. A bigger battery will have a bigger amp hour rating. A smaller one will have a smaller amp hour rating. That's just what I remember off the top of my head. Now, when it comes to the modern replacement for nickel cadmiums, your nickel metal hydrides, I think I've seen double A nickel metal hydrides. Um, and this might be low. I seem to recall seeing them that go up to 2,000 milliamp hours. Or basically two amp hours. So your nickel metal hydrides uh, have a much uh, more robust chemistry than your nickel cadmiums, which have been basically replaced with the nickel metal hydride. So that's some uh, basic ideas of what a battery is. It's two dissimilar metals uh, with an acid or a base, uh, all kinds of different chemistries. And we have different voltages depending on the chemistry. And then we have different amp hour ratings depending on the chemistry and the size. And one amp hour means it'll give us an amp for an hour or half an amp for two hours or two amps for half an hour. And you just Basically, amp hour, you're multiplying amps times hours, and that's uh, the number we get. Another aspect of batteries is a property called internal resistance. When we talk about batteries and circuits, when we are up here on the whiteboard and talking about lessons, we'll make a circuit something like this and say, okay, there we have, oh, how about a 10 volt battery? And we have a one ohm resistor. How much current am I going to get through that resistor? Well, we have 10 volts, one ohm. Uh, Ohm's law says if you know your voltage, divide into it. So one goes into 10, 10 times, I'm going to get 10 amps of current in that circuit. But what we do when we do these classroom uh, circuits is we make an assumption that's definitely not true. And that is that this battery will produce 10 volts no matter how much current is coming out of it. But in reality, a battery is not quite so simple. If you recall our lesson on Thevenin's theorem, what does Thevenin's theorem say? That any circuit can be represented by a voltage source and a impedance in series with it. Well, impedance has to do with alternating current, so we're going to make a simpler uh, look at this in just DC where we're going to call that simply resistance. So impedance is a combination of resistance and capacitive reactance and inductive reactance, which we'll talk about down in alternating current. So our battery is just going to have uh, basically a voltage source and a series resistance. So our battery really looks like this. 
and let's say that resistor, depending on the chemistry and the size of the battery, so the bigger battery has a smaller internal resistance than a smaller battery of the same uh, chemistry. So let's say that has um, oh, 0.1 ohms of internal resistance. So our battery is really that. So what are we really going to get out of this battery? So I really have not one ohm of resistance but 1.1 ohms. And so I'm actually going to get basically only about 9.09 .09 amps or something like that. I think of my, I can't do math in my head, so I might be a little off on that. Basically, we'll just round that down to not 10 amps, but 9 amps. And so I'm really only going to get about 9 volts across that 1 ohm with this particular battery. Now, if I have a bigger battery, it's going to have less internal resistance, and so I'll get more current, but as I increase my internal resistance either by making my battery smaller or as my battery ages, that internal resistance gets bigger, this voltage is going to get smaller and smaller. So the theory about how a battery actually works is that a battery has a voltage that never changes, and we have an internal resistance in series with that voltage, and the amount of current I can get out of that battery depends on that internal resistance. And as that battery ages, as I use up the battery, this internal resistance gets bigger and bigger. So after a while, that internal resistance might get up to, instead of a tenth of an ohm, it's a whole ohm. Now what's happened to my current and my uh, voltage out here? So now I have my one ohm out here, but I have an ohm in series with it. Well. Just take a quick look at this, remembering our Kirchhoff's voltage law and all the other rules of series circuits. I have a 10 volt battery here, two equal resistors. This voltage must be distributed proportionally among these resistors. Since they're equal resistance, I'll have equal voltage. And those two voltages must add up to the battery voltage. So I must have a voltage here and a voltage here. Those must be equal and must add up to 10. So I have 5 volts and 5 volts. So as that battery ages and this internal resistance gets bigger, I get less and less voltage across it and uh, less and less voltage out of it. And so now I have 1 ohm and 5 volts. So instead of getting uh, 10 amps, I'm going to get 5 amps. As the battery ages, I get less voltage and less current out of it because my internal resistance gets bigger and bigger. For example, let's say Let's start from scratch here. I have a battery. I want to know what its internal resistance is. So what I'm going to do is put a voltmeter across there. And let's say that says I have uh, 10 volts. Okay, so now I know that's a 10 volt battery because there's no current, so there's no voltage drop. And just like Thevenin's theorem, I know I have the battery voltage. But now I put a current meter across here, but I don't want to short it out. So let's say I put a one ohm resistor, just enough to give me a little bit of current limiting. And let's say I got 0.5 amps. Okay, so 0.5 amps and 10 volts, that's going to give me a total of two ohms of resistance. So if I have two ohms of resistance total, if I subtract one ohm from that, that means I have one ohm left over there. So I don't have to short this out to find out the internal resistance. I can put some resistance in series, find out my total resistance by taking open circuit voltage, current with some series resistance. Now I know what my voltage is. I know what my current is. That's going to tell me my total resistance. Subtract my known resistance from the total. That leaves over my internal resistance. So that's a better way to do that. So shorting it's not a recommended thing to do. Another thing we want to avoid is when we are putting batteries in something, don't be mixing fresh batteries with old batteries. The reason is that the fresh battery can overcome the old battery and force current going through it the wrong way. And that can, um, probably an old battery is not going to explode, but it's probably going to make it leak at best could possibly cause it to explode. Never mix old batteries and new batteries. If you have some batteries in a battery box and some are fresh and some are old, uh, toss them out and put all fresh batteries in there and make sure that uh, they're all the same age because we don't want that uh, new batteries forcing current the wrong way through old batteries. So don't be mixing fresh batteries and old batteries. 
And as I mentioned before, what are batteries? We have uh, two dissimilar metals in an acid or a base. Sometimes that acid can be very strong, such as a car battery. A car battery has sulfuric acid in it. So be careful with batteries. They have acid or strong bases in them. So we need to be careful with them, especially those with liquid electrolytes like car batteries. We don't want to be spilling that uh, around. So uh, that's another safety factor. Batteries have acids. And last but not least, don't be recharging batteries that are not designed to be recharged. So for example, you can buy rechargers that are advertised that they will recharge alkaline batteries that are not labeled as rechargeable. Trust me, don't do it. You will cause those batteries to leak. And normally when an alkaline battery leaks naturally, it, uh, it, the electrolyte dries up into crystals. It might do some minor damage to the contacts, but usually won't destroy your equipment. But if you recharge alkaline batteries, it changes the chemistry in some way that causes them to leak liquids that can get into your stuff and wreck it. Do not be recharging batteries that are not labeled as rechargeable. There are rechargeable alkaline batteries, but if they're not labeled as rechargeable, don't recharge them. And they do have special chargers that are for rechargeable alkaline batteries. Don't go buy one of those things off the shelf that says, it will recharge your alkaline batteries. Don't be using those. And speaking of rechargeable batteries, there are two basic types of batteries. There are primary batteries and secondary batteries, which are $10 ways of saying your primary battery is not rechargeable, your secondary battery is rechargeable. So let's look at some common primary batteries to begin with, common non-rechargeable batteries. Perhaps the oldest one around is the carbon zinc. Also known as heavy duty. So you go to buy some batteries and there's some alkaline batteries that are kind of expensive and some heavy duty batteries, which are a lot cheaper, which is the better deal. No, stay away from carbon zinc or heavy duty batteries. They are prone to leak. They don't last very long to begin with. They're prone to leak. When they do, they leak this brown goo that gets into everything and ruins whatever they were put in. Do not buy carbon zinc batteries. I would like to see them disappear off the market. So if they say heavy duty, you know they're carbon zinc, don't buy them, go to the alkaline batteries. Uh, your carbon zinc battery produces, I think, 1.6 volts per cell, and it's a, equivalent to the alkaline batteries. The alkaline batteries are direct replacement. Whatever they are, do not buy them, buy alkaline batteries. Okay, so your alkaline battery. A new chemistry came out around in the late 60s, if I remember right. And I remember there used to be a battery brand called Mallory, and they made the worst batteries. They didn't last very long. They were more prone to leak than other people's batteries. And I, I just stayed away from them. Then Mallory invented a new chemistry that we now know as the alkaline battery. And then Mallory changed their name to Duracell. So uh, the Duracell is the original alkaline battery. Of course, the patents have expired and everybody makes alkaline batteries now. At one time, Mallory made all alkaline batteries. No matter who sold them, they were made by Duracell or made by Mallory. But uh, now uh, that's no longer true because the patents expired long ago. Lots of different people make alkaline batteries. And I watched a video on YouTube not too long ago where somebody took a number of brands of uh, AA alkaline batteries and tested them against each other. So I tend to get the AC Delco brand because he said they're the best. But Pretty much alkaline batteries are alkaline batteries. If they say they're alkaline, those are the ones you want to get. And uh, I buy the cheapest ones I can get because the chemistry is pretty much the same. Yes, Duracell and EverReady will say that theirs are better. Are they? I really don't know. Like I said, this one guy tested a bunch of them and said, huh, I think the AC Delcos are the best. So if I see those, I grab them. So that's the alkaline battery. Long, uh, long life, they last on the shelf uh, five to seven years or something like that without use. And, um, they produce a good amount of current for a long time. They're not a high current battery. If you need a high current application, you're going to want to use nickel metal hydrides. But for most applications, uh, the alkaline battery is your best bet. Another common type of battery is a lithium battery. Most commonly you find your lithium battery as your uh, little coin cells, uh, the 2032 is common and they are 3.7 volts per cell. And another kind of battery that's typically used for hearing aids is a zinc air battery. 
And technically this isn't a battery, it's technically a fuel cell because it, it actually uses a chemistry that oxidizes when the air contacts it and produces its um, uh, voltage that way and produces a byproduct of uh, some gases when it does. When you buy a zinc air battery, you'll notice there's a little label covering a hole on it and that actually activates the battery or activates the fuel cell and causes it to start doing its job. So you don't want to take off that label until you're ready to use the battery. So those are some common uh, primary batteries that are not rechargeable. Now to secondary batteries that are rechargeable, uh, perhaps the most common these days is going to be your lithium ion battery. And most commonly see these in computers. And I held up a lithium ion cell earlier. This is a, a I keep forgetting the number, 18650, the most common size of a lithium ion battery. You tear apart your computer battery, you're likely to find these in there. And if you tear apart your Tesla battery, you're going to find thousands of these guys in there. Your lithium ion batteries uh, tend to have about an 18 month uh, shelf life. So even if they're not used, they tend to wear. So if you buy an old computer, you pretty good chance you're gonna to have to buy a new battery for it and if you buy a new battery make sure it's really a new battery don't be buying new old stock or whatever because uh, they do have a shelf life if you buy uh, one that's been around a while it's probably not going to uh, be very good uh, it's probably not going to be in good condition so uh, that's the problem with lithium ion, lithium ion. Uh, they hold a lot of power density they're great when they're new but as they age they get worse and worse which is a problem for devices such as cell phones and Apple computers that do not have replaceable batteries. So, uh, but lithium ion has a very high power density. There's a variation of the lithium ion called the lithium ion polymer, which is typically a flat battery. They can be made in a number of shapes. The, the lithium ion polymer, um, they have a reputation of tending to uh, catch fire at random times. And, uh, but that's probably what's in your phone right now. It seems like that problem has been largely solved. But uh, well, about 10 years ago, in the late, uh, late uh, around 2008, 2009 or so, um, the Boeing 787 had problems because they had lithium ion polymer batteries in there and they were starting to explode. And they had to ground the 787 for a while until they solved that problem. But it's something that I haven't heard of in a while. I think that problem has been largely solved, but you can go onto YouTube and find lots of videos of lithium ion polymer batteries catching fire. In fact, you uh, used to be able to buy charging bags to put them in because they could catch fire while charging or discharging or just sitting on the shelf. But uh, they were most likely to catch fire when they were charging, so they had these bags you could put them in to uh, safely charge them in case they caught fire. So lithium ion polymer, a variation on lithium ion. Uh, very common battery these days. They produce 3.7 volts per cell and uh, most common batteries in computers and cell phones and almost all of your rechargeable uh, devices will be using your lithium ion or lithium ion polymer batteries. A little older one is the uh, nickel cadmium battery. Nickel and cadmium. Now NICAD is actually a trade name, N-I-C-A-D, but N-I-C-D is just the chemistry. And you don't see these too often very these days, but I do see them in these little rechargeable lights that you can buy and stick along your walkway, then they charge from the sun in the daytime and then um, run at night. Uh, nickel cadmium battery is rechargeable once again. They produce 1.25 volts per cell. So it's almost direct replacement of um, your uh, alkaline battery, but a little less voltage, but they produce a lot more current. So they have a very low internal resistance. Interesting problem with the nickel cadmium battery that was discovered probably the worst way. Um, a NASA satellite was launched. I don't remember which satellite it was particularly, but I read about this in a book published by General Electric, so I think it's trustworthy. Uh, the satellite uh, idea was that it was in orbit around the Earth. So here is the Earth. There's our satellite with its solar cells. And it had nickel cadmium batteries. And as it orbited, it would go into the Earth's shadow. And so it would have to run on batteries when it was in the Earth's shadow. And then it came out and recharged the batteries. So it would run on the batteries for a while, then top them off in the sunlight, run on the batteries and top them off in the sunlight. And after a few months, it started losing capacity. And what they discovered is that the chemistry in a nickel cadmium battery was such that as time goes by, crystals would grow in there if you would top it off, use it a little bit, then top it off, then use it a little bit. These crystals would grow that would start shorting out the battery. 
So if we look at the discharge curve, nickel cadmium has a very good discharge curve um, compared to an alkaline. An alkaline will discharge and kind of follow a curve like that. So as time goes by, the voltage goes down, 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 down. Nickel cadmium pretty much holds its voltage over time, over time, over time, and then suddenly drops off. So you have a good, uh, pretty even voltage until it runs out of juice. But they found that as you top it off and then use it a little bit, top it off, use it a little bit, it starts following a curve that looks more like that. Drops off and then falls off. And as time goes by and you keep charging it, topping it off and then using it a little bit, that happens earlier and earlier and earlier. Conversely, if you use it a little bit, then let it discharge, charge it a little bit, let it discharge. It has a very similar curve, but the chemistry that causes it is different uh, from uh, when you use it a little bit, then top it off. So two different scenarios with nickel cadmium batteries that are bad for the battery. One, topping it off, using it a little bit, topping it off, using it a little bit, or charging it a little bit and then discharging, charging it a little bit, then discharging. Nickel cadmium batteries need to be periodically um, reconditioned where you completely discharge them. And uh, the General Electric book recommended uh, uh, discharging them with a light bulb for 24 hours and then shorting them together for another 24 hours. Uh, I said don't short batteries, but basically it's discharged and you completely discharge it and then recharge it. And that would tend to recharge the uh, recondition the battery. So that was a problem with uh, nickel cadmiums and they called that the memory effect. Nickel metal hydrides have a higher capacity and less memory effect and they're basically a direct replacement. So your charger that worked with a nickel cadmium battery will also work with nickel metal hydrides and uh, they're pretty much a direct replacement but have much less memory effect. But you don't see them a lot anymore anyway. Two different types of nickel metal hydrides worth mentioning. There is the regular ones and there's one called pre-charged. The difference is that a nickel metal hydride battery, if you charge it and leave it on the shelf after 90 days or so, it loses enough of its charge that it's useless and needs to be recharged. But there is one chemistry that will hold 95% uh, of its charge for a year. And when you buy your nickel metal hydride batteries, typically you have to charge them before you use them. That'll be in the instructions, charge before use. But then you might buy some that say on the package in big letters, pre-charged meaning that you can just take them out of the package and use them if they haven't been laying on the shelf for too long. And so they have a longer charged shelf life. You can charge them and leave them on the shelf unused for a much longer period of time. So if you want the ones that can be charged and don't discharge quickly, buy the pre-charged type. So that's your nickel metal hydrides. Pre-charged uh, don't tend to self-discharge as bad as the uh, regular ones. And I mentioned that the nickel cadmiums are used in those little lights that you can pl uh, you know, put on your walkway and they charge in the daytime. Well, they tend to completely discharge overnight, so they get exercised every day. So they're a little cheaper than your nickel metal hydride, and that's where I tend to find them. I've taken those apart and, uh, oh, look, nickel cadmium. Haven't seen that in a long time. So typically you go and buy rechargeable batteries that are a direct replacement for alkalines. So they're going to be nickel metal hydride, and there's the pre-charged type and the regular type. Uh, you don't find nickel cadmiums uh, very often anymore as a replacement for your alkaline batteries. And finally, another very common type of rechargeable battery is the lead acid battery. And the way they work is uh, basically you have two plates of lead that are in a uh, sulfuric acid. And they put a voltage across here. And that causes one of the plates to become, I might not be 100% correct on this chemistry, but I believe one gets coated with lead sulfide and the other one becomes coated with lead oxide. I might not be exactly right, but they become dissimilar. So they start out as two lead plates. You put voltage across them and they change into two dissimilar compositions and then you can discharge them and then you can reverse it and discharge them uh, many times over. Uh, there are basically two types of, well, that's, let's say three types of lead acid batteries. Two major types are regular and deep discharge. So your deep discharge ones are going to be ones you use such as on golf carts or other electric vehicles where you want to be able to you know, discharge them uh, a lot and then recharge them. They can handle that. They're made more robust. Your typical car battery is not a deep discharge battery. It's supposed to be held fully charged and it 
only starts your car and then is topped off again. And your car does not run from the battery, but runs from the alternator. And so your regular car battery is not a deep discharge version and it uh, is actually damaged if you discharge it too much. Then you have the deep discharge version that can be used to run uh, motors and such that uh, can handle the deep discharge. And the other third type is the gel cell and the acid is a gel substance and this battery can be used in all orientations. So your typical lead acid battery must be kept horizontal because it's full of acid, but your gel cell can be um, put in different ways, um, uh, different orientations without, uh, without a, a worry about spilling the acid. Now finally, there are some batteries on the horizon that uh, have promised to replace the batteries we have today with much higher uh, capacities. One is a sugar battery that uses uh, sugar as part of the chemistry. I don't know exactly how that works, but theoretically they have a very high energy density and can last a very long time. They're not rechargeable, but can last quite some time. In fact, I think I have read about rechargeable versions that you can put sugar water in and um, replenish them. But that's something that's on the horizon that may or may not be developed. Uh, someone has come up with a battery that actually uses uh, nuclear waste in such a way that the uh, amount of nuclear material there is uh, very small and safe, but can take uh, nuclear waste and actually make a battery that can last for quite some time. Uh, that might be science fiction, it might be science reality in some day, but that's something that's uh, on the horizon. And of course, uh, Tesla and GM and other companies that want to make uh, electric cars are trying to come up with better and better batteries because uh, batteries do have a limitation. They may have a lot of uh, energy, but they're also very heavy. And uh, so the quest is to make batteries that last longer and are lighter. And we'll have to see how that uh, comes on the horizon in the future. If you found this video useful and informative, please give me a thumbs up down below. It really helps the channel. And subscribe because that not only informs you when I put new videos up, but it really helps the channel also. And a big thank you to my patrons at Patreon. I could not make these videos without your support. If you want to help me put these videos online and keep real vocational education free at vocademy.net, you can go to Patreon slash join slash vocademy and pledge your support. And again, a big thank you to my patrons who make this possible, and a big thank you to everyone for watching.